She was so great about the semi slivers that it's so dang solid. And your, your opponents notice, they don't know if they play normal moves, they're not going to be able to get an advantage. So you basically say they're going to sacrifice the pawn. You know, you're going to say, yeah, I'm going to get some attack because I don't know how else to play against semi slab. So it's very simple. You just take the uh, pawn, you know, wait for you to make some crazy mistake like bishop e3, and then you simply win the game. If it's good enough for Carlson, it's good enough for you guys as well. Illingworth Chess, the best to improve your chess. What's up guys, GM Max here, and this video is all about how to play the semi-slav. And you might think it's an opening video, and it is, but it's also a How Magnus Carlsen Beat David Anton Gujaro video from the Skilling Open. And who doesn't love to do lots of good skilling? I mean, as a video game player myself, I love to skill, grind those levels, get that rating up. So after 9 f 3 9 6 the starting position of the semi-slav, which you guys will probably recognize from the previous two videos, like Anand being Carlson, Carlson being Anand, is this semi-slab position where we build that beautiful triangle of pawns, you know, we can call it an Egyptian pyramid. And you guys being a geezer, my parents have. Well, the idea is not just to build the pyramid, but also if they do play some move like bishop to g5, well, you get some extra options. Like you can, the dynamic way is to take here, like if you want some real hair raising complications, something that will make your hair uh, you know, go away, make your gold bald by the time you turn 30, then I recommend learning the Botvinnik semi-slav with bishop h4, g5. And there's a whole ton of theory that maybe should be covered in a separate video, because this one, yeah, it's going to be a million years by the time we get to the bottom of this. So if you want something a little more safe, you can go h6. And then if they take, you get the bishop pair, which is pretty cool. Or if bishop h4, you can then take on here. And you can't get a better version of a Botvinnik where rather than the pawn getting the f6 in your face, you get to hang on to your extra pawn and basically memorize 100 moves of Fury on route to either making a draw, or if the opponent forgets the Fury, you win the game. Pretty decent outcome if you have lots of time to kill on your hands. But given that, you know, you probably, you know, have been busy, you know, liking this video, commenting below, and also subscribing to the channel, well, obviously you probably want a more practical solution. In that case, I can suggest to move knight d7 as a solid alternative. It's known as the Cambridge Springs when we play queen to a5. You know, good ideas like knight e4, bishop b4 to pile the pressure on the knight on c3. No, I do have to be honest and say that if white plays all the best moves, he does get a very small advantage. For example, a move like cd5, you know, knight d5. And rook c1 does give white pretty decent play. But black is still very solid. You know, you can take on c3. You know, the idea of this is a rook c3, bishop b4 is a pretty nasty pin. So after bc3, we kind of get a good square for the bishop. I usually don't want to take on a2, because then you give white a bit too much for lead in development and too much central initiative. So it's better not to take the pawn, but just develop actively, and then trade off your bishop. And once you trade off that bad bishop again, c5, you're generally going to be able to equalize without a huge amount of struggle here. Uh, and then I can go knight d2, but yeah, you go bishop b4, and you know, black is very solid. Or if you want to just sort of force off their bishop pair, you can also go dc4. You're hitting the bishop from afar. I mean, in this case, like, white's got a tiny edge with the extra space, but with the bishop pair, black is very solid. You know, moves like bishop e7, castles, you know, b6, bishop b7. Like, black is not in terrible danger here. The only danger is that you might not necessarily win the game quickly, but okay, it's true. If the opponent plays good moves, we're not winning quickly anyway. So let's learn how to make the opponent play some bad moves. Well, if they play cd5, you just go ed5. And, I mean, you're just laughing at this point because... White has a very poor man's version of exchange queen scam to decline, where he put that now on f3 a bit too early, and if he does play bishop to g5 to pin the knight, we can just go h6 and you know, bishop h4, then bishop f5, and you know, once you get the bishop to this beautiful diagonal, you're just very, very comfortable. Your bishop can go to either d6 or e7, you castle, you plot a knight on e4 in the middle game, and just basically make their king in the middle game. All pretty good stuff. Um, so yeah, basically CD5 also pretty harmless, but it's a movie you might face a lot at the club level So it's good to know how to deal with it, but it gives basically an improved version of exchange QGD So we have the move E3 and and okay, you guys already know a little bit about this from my previous videos You may have called it Carlson beat Anand with the move Queen to C2 and then Anand beat Carlson with a move Bishop D3 So I've already got a few ideas with some of these moves, so I will point out that after Queen C2 and bishop d6, and of course, why is not forced to play the move g4 that Carlson did in that game. There are other approaches as well, like playing bishop to d3. You know, even b3 is also a move, but I mean, b3 I'm not too scared about. Because if they go bishop b2, e5 tends to be a pretty good break in the semi-slav. The reason you want to play e5 is that it really makes your bishop very active. And 
Also, with the White King in the centre, it kind of makes sense to open up that centre so that our piece can get very active and we can, you know, start to attack their king in the middle. Yeah, you get a nice, like, Queen's Pawn, but it's really not a big deal. I mean, you're able to defend the pawn and you get a nice C file for the rook, so it's not all bad for black. Now, also, they can play a move Bishop D3, and this is probably the critical move which requires the most theoretical knowledge to know to play as black. But in this case, I mean, you can always just castle. Castle, and, you know, you have a, a choice of a few options. If you want to play the way Carlson did in the game, you can play B6 is here as well. But I don't think it's anywhere near as good as in the as what we see in the version of the game with the bishop on E2. So instead, my recommendation would be to play the move D takes C4 and to then learn the fury with B5. Like, there's a lot of sharp fury, but at least the ideas are pretty straightforward for black. You're going to go bishop B7. You're going to meet E4 with E5, making sure that they don't just get the whole center run challenge. That's the first point of the bishop being on D6. And the second point is if they don't play the move E4, well, we can play moves like Rook C8 and prepare the C5 push, and that's going to give Black pretty reasonable play. You know, if they go B4, you can go A5 and kind of chip away at the quick side like that. So whether they let you get in C5, whether they try to stop you, you're going to get counterplay either way in this case. If this is a bit too theoretical for your taste, I can point out that there are solid alternatives like E5. Is another approach if you want a more open position and you're happy to play with the IQP. These lines can be a little bit drawish, though, in my experience, whereas the lines I showed with DC4 are a lot spicier. So if you'd rather play for the win or play for a draw, well, you've got two options to work with there. Well, Anton Gijaro played the move uh, Bishop E2, just showing for a solid development, but you're going to notice that the Bishop is a lot less active on E2 than it is on D3, because if the Bishop was on D3, you could play the move E4, which is why it's Dream Pawn Break in the, uh, in the semi-slav, because you activate that passive bishop on c1, and if you get rid of that d5 pawn, well, white's going to have two pawns side by side in the center. I could explain more, but I'm going to kind of see that come up in the game as well, because white played a move queen c2, and black played a very solid move of b6. I find that in the semi slab like the one bad thing I can say about the semi slab is that you are shutting in your bishop behind this triangle of pawns, but it's actually only a temporary problem, because once that bishop gets fee and keto, and again c5, you're generally doing pretty all right. Uh, I mean, if white goes b3, you know, you can just play bishop b7, bishop b2, rook e8. You're just going to play like queen e7, rook c8, maybe c5 in the middle game. And you don't really have any major problems to speak of. You know, if white does play to move e4, we're kind of going to see how that plays out in the game. But slower approaches also tend to be okay for black here. Uh, well, in any case, the game saw e4. And yeah, it's a move that looks more critical, but actually after takes, takes, it's not really causing any problems because after bishop b7 what we're going to see here is that queen is actually a little bit exposed to attack you know we could hit him with knight f6 and once you get a break like c5 which is your dream break in the semi-slav well then that bishop gets a new release of life and your pieces are very very active i find the semi-slav is one of the few openings that actually allow you to combine active piece play with also having the from a very solid foundation it's a system where you can basically defend very well but also attack at the same time there aren't a lot of openings that are like that, so that's why I love the semi-slav and why I was very successful in my own games back when I was playing chess. So I played a bit of rook to f d1. Uh, one funny version I want to share with you guys is if white does play bishop to f4, you could actually play the move c5. It might look like you're blundering, but if queen b7, we now have bishop f4. And Well, I think that when it comes to obstacle bishops, that black's bishop is not worse than white's. You can play queen c7 to force the queen back, and I think that life is pretty good for black here. Ah, uh, well, instead, I played rook d1. And it's a very natural move to play rook d1, where you're putting the rook opposite the queen. So that means if black does get into c5 later, well, the rook can be very well placed on that newly opened d-file. So Carlson plays queen c7, and this is sort of where we get to a kind of crunch moment of the game. You see, even with black not having anything other than pawns covering a king, it's actually very hard to get that king it was white. Because you play something like bishop d3, black's just going to go g6, and... Yeah, it looks like you're weak in those dark squares, but it's not that easy to exploit. Because if you go bishop h6, you can go c5 and kind of rip things open with the discovered attack on the queen. You know, d5, rook f8, and we kind of see why it's not really getting that queen to g7 anytime soon. But otherwise, yeah, you have moves like knight e5, e d5, and you know, white's got a few little weaknesses to deal with here. So a better move for white is probably to get the queen out of the way with queen h4. But again, c5 works pretty well. Because if you're able to get rid of that one central pawn, it makes it much harder for white to get an effective attack. If you play a move like d5, I think you can simply take, you know, c takes d5 and 
While the move rook a to d8 is, I think, perfectly fine. You know, bishop g5, you meet with f6. Bishop h6, you've got rook f3, f8. I think the idea is like a6 and just pushing a majority. Maybe playing with like 95 to swap some pieces at the right moment. I feel like black's going to be relatively solid. I mean, it's probably the most danger going to really come into possibly in this line as black. And even here, it's not really anything serious if we consult our Oracle Stockfish 13.1254 development build. In any case, the game instead saw Anton play the move of c5. Why do he play c5? Well, his idea is he wants to try and stop by getting in a c5 break. And he's willing to sacrifice a pawn to not allow it. It's actually a very reasonable idea, I think. I mean, I don't think it gives white an advantage, but I do think that after knight c5 and queen c2, that white does have very good compensation. But you never know when a move like knight g5 is going to be kind of annoying, forcing some weaknesses around the king's side. You know, should be free to kick the knight as well can be a bit of a pain. Carlson decided to play the move rook a to d8, which is perfectly fine. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd be tempted to play a move like h6 here and just not allow a knight g5 or a bishop g5 with tempo. The trade-off is you are allowing b4, and that is kind of annoying after knight a6. You know, you want to play knight d7, but then the pin is going to be kind of annoying on the d-file. So in this case, you would end up with the knight being offside, and I guess that Carlson didn't want to allow his knight being stuck on the edge of the board like this, even if something like c5 probably should still be okay for black. Well, instead we had the move rook a d8, and well, bishop g5, bishop b7, so just, you know, keeping the, uh, the tension. And here at this point, I mean, you could just play rook a c1, you know, bring all the pieces into play, try to threaten to win a piece with bishop to e7 followed by queen c5. To be fair, black should still be doing fine here, but okay, I think that instead, well, the move rook d8 doesn't really spoil anything either, but I think it's a slight inaccuracy to let black get that control over the d file for free and to develop for free. I guess you could still play b4, and you, know, you could still trap their knight in like this. And you know, I guess if white's black's not getting an easy c5, white can claim pretty good compensation. But I mean, in the worst case, black can play c5 here, and well, basically give back the pawn. Like it's sort of a cap of blanket principle that you give back the pawn just to kind of neutralize their pressure. I'd say bishop b7 takes, take, take. You know, you can play b c5, and, and white gets the pawn back, but black does have a bishop against a knight, so I would say black has the better side of equality at least here. You know, bishop b7, and you know, it can be a bit annoying like this. Well, instead, uh, Anton played rook c1, and after rook d5, this was kind of the turning point. Well, I think it's still not too late to play a move like b4 if you're white. Because in that case, I mean, if black does go execute his threat of bishop g5, we can't see much like in a Karpov Lortier game that, well, the bishop is kind of stuck on b7 because it's kind of trapped behind the pawn. So I think that would give white decent positional compensation, in fact. Uh, of course, Black's not forced to play Bishop G5, but if you're able to kind of keep that pawn on B4, A3, well, that structure is pretty solid for White, as we saw, and that's kind of a good job of making that extra pawn not so useful for Black. But instead, White retreated with Bishop E3, and unfortunately, that kind of loses some of the momentum that White had kept. Uh, Black played move Knight D7 here. Uh, actually, I like the move Bishop A6, because I think that Bishop wasn't doing a whole lot on B7, so I think that trading it did have a certain logic to it. Uh, keep in mind, of course, that we aren't giving the pawn back because queen c6 would allow a back rank mate on rook d1 at the end of the captures, uh, which is why it would have been good for white to, well, well, to not uh, not take on c6. But anyway, black played knight d7, which still keeps some sort of edge. But I mean, I guess white could go knight d2 and, you know, bishop f3 can put a little pressure on that pawn. You know, it's still white uh, fighting and alive and kicking. But say we had knight d4, and unfortunately knight d4, it's a good attempt to attack the pawn, but it just doesn't work because of Carlson's next move. I'm not sure if I said a puzzle for you guys yet, so what would be your move that you would play? Can you play like Magnus Carlson? If you're not sure that you can, well, make sure to smash that like button so I know to make more videos like this one, so you can start playing more like Magnus as well. And also comment below with the move that you would play in this position, that way we can compare who came up with the right answer. You know, it doesn't matter if you got it wrong because we're all here to learn. You know, mistakes are how we learn, guys. So the move is bishop to c5. And it's a really great active move because we're not just shielding the pawn, but we're also hitting the knight. So that's to really take that initiative. And if you go queen c3, c which white should have done, well, I mean, you can even play moves like queen d6 or queen b6. It kind of annoyed a bishop, but I think black should be doing pretty well here. But instead after knight b5, like Anton Forty could get the pawn back with cb5 and b4, using the pin this way. Unfortunately, Carlson, as is often the case, was one step ahead of him. And he realized that the move queen to c6 is just a game-ending move. Because now if white takes back that bishop, you've got the move rook d1. 
And boom, we've got a Trek made on G2. Next move, we can pre-move it actually. Uh, so instead of that, we had the uh, continuation Bishop F3. I no, was trying to get out of this with the pin, but after Bishop B3, there's not very really much white can really do. I mean, if you play Queen C6, you can only take one piece at a time as white. And Bishop takes D5, Bishop E3 is not really helping. But if you go F takes E3, black will just go Knight E5. And just defending the bishop from attack. And I'll take you, I just don't play Bishop D5, Rook C8, checkmate. But play E D5 and, you know, you're just basically up almost the equivalent of a piece at this point as black. Well, the game ended F takes E3, Queen B6. And after Bishop takes D5, Queen takes E3 with a check. King H1, Bishop D5. Since Queen C8 is leading nowhere after the 9F8 block, why is just down way too much material? Like he's down equivalent of a piece, and therefore he resigned here. So yeah, guys, that's how to play the semi-slav. Just play it like solely the way that I showed you. Give you enough ideas to work with. Do make sure to subscribe to Illingworth Chess for more videos like this one. And good luck playing the semi-slav in your own games. I will see you all in the next video. Illingworth Chess, the best to improve your chess.